You never think anything like this would actually happen. It's something out of a movie, really. About a year ago, I was dating this girl, Desi. She was just my type. Short, blonde, bubbly, with a seemingly great personality. We were getting really close, even moved in together after three months of dating. Now I look back and wonder, what was I thinking? It all started off small after about six months of going steady. I would say something funny, she would laugh in this cute Hollywood style laugh, but then after her laugh, for just a split second, her face would go blank. It caught me off guard the first time I saw it, but over time I noticed it again and again. Like after she would say, I love you, she would have a smile on her face, then the blank expression and back into looking regular, reminded me of someone changing a mask. As if she couldn't go from one expression to another, she had to change in between them. All right, not really a big deal. Could have been my imagination or I was reading too much into things. That's what I thought at first, until I noticed she never cried at anything, ever. Even when her dog died, she buried him out in the woods and went about her life like nothing had happened. All the while, when she dug the hole, she had the same blank expression she wore when she changed her mask definitely unsettling to say the least. Cut to eight months into the relationship. She's going through my phone and accusing me of sleeping with every female friend I have, telling me if I loved her I wouldn't need to talk to other women. Tears streaming down her face, mascara a mess, and hiccups in between sobs. I tried not to overreact because I knew she had been in some really bad relationships in the past. According to her, more than a few of her boyfriends had cheated on her so I tried to be sympathetic and delete the friends that were more of acquaintances. I also suggested that she get some therapy to help her with her insecurities. She did go to get help, or so she told me. Around the time she started going through my phone, we found out she was pregnant, which caused me to chalk up some of her behaviors to hormonal changes. Three months later, she miscarried. If things were bad before, that miscarriage sent her over the edge. Not that I could blame her, it's hard after losing a child, born or not. I was shaken from it myself. We had talked about not trying again anytime soon, that maybe we had rushed things the first time. I know I wasn't ready, but then I caught her one night poking holes into my condoms. That was the final straw, we split right then and there. She got mad, threw things at me, cursed at me and then ran off crying to her car. She peeled that red compact out of there so fast she almost hit another vehicle. All was quiet for about two weeks until one night when I got a phone call around 11 p.m. I was asleep when the phone rang, so I wasn't all there when I answered it. Hello, I said. My salutation was greeted with silence. Hello, I repeated. Then a high-pitched voice that sounded like someone trying to be a kid began to sing. rock a baby the treetop when the wind blows the cradle will rock who the hell is this when the bell breaks the cradle will fall and death to the baby cradle and all who is this i demanded my mind still trying to comprehend what was happening it's your unborn child you bastard the voice screamed then hung up at first i thought i was having a bad dream or something Blinding light from the phone reassured me I was most certainly awake. Caller ID showed the call from an unknown number. I mean, I thought I knew who did it, but didn't want to believe that Desi would go to that extreme or do something so bizarre. For the rest of the night, I stayed awake listening for odd sounds in the night, just in case she went even further. The next morning, I crawled into work, bloodshot eyes and a triple espresso in hand. Her childlike voice played over and over again in my head. Unbelievable that she would have stooped to something so crazy. Images of her mask-like face whirled in my mind, making me question if I ever really knew her at all. What was behind that face? What was she hiding with it? Work was a blur of computer screens and papers. Finally, five o'clock rolled around and I was able to go home. My thoughts immediately turned to a warm shower in bed. I was daydreaming of how comfortable my sheets would be when I got to my car. 
Lost in my thoughts, I didn't notice anything until I was right up on it. Scrawled on my windshield in bright red lipstick were the words, Murderer. Honestly, she should have waited at least another day to do that. In my delirious state, the impact of her insane act was completely lost to me. I simply got in my car and drove home with those crimson words there for all to see. It was 6 when I got home. By 8 I was sound asleep. Around 2 in the morning I woke up to something tapping on my bedroom window. Keep in mind, I sleep on the second floor. Something tapping on my window is strange in itself. First I tried to ignore it, but it didn't stop. Tap, 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 pause, tap, tap, tap. Prayers tumbled from my lips that it was some strange bird repeatedly running into my window or noises from the house settling. Laying there on my stomach, pillow wrapped around my head, trying to block the noise, I finally lost it. Alright, what is it? What the hell is it this time? I screamed, arms raised in desperation, sheets clung to my legs. With a quick shake, I knocked them free. Completely enraged from having been disturbed for the last two nights, I threw open the window. A streetlight backlit an object in the tree. Not until the wind picked it up did I notice a shadowy figure swing towards me. I nearly jumped out of my skin as a lifelike doll pressed against the window screen. Its appearance made grotesque by the deep red of its cheeks, a missing eye, and hair torn out in clumps. Light from the street lamp glinted off of a hundred steel pins jabbed all over it giving it the appearance of Pinhead's offspring. Surprisingly, my scream didn't wake the neighbors. Immediately I dropped to the floor and scurried to the other side of my bed. Arms wrapped around my legs, I huddled there for the rest of the night, rocking back and forth. In the morning, I called in sick to work. Later, I called Desi. Desi, this is Norman. You gotta stop doing this or I'll call the cops. I thought I told you never to call me. The baby in the tree, lipstick on my car windshield and the late night phone call? I know it was you. Norm, you asshole. I'm in Michigan visiting my mom. I couldn't have done any of that. You know, first you destroy my world, and now you make up wild accusations? My mom's right. I'm lucky you broke up with me. You are completely insane. Rotten hell. With that, she terminated the phone call. I got up from my fetal position to go downstairs and get breakfast. Once at the top of the stairs, something struck me as odd. My head turned back towards the bedroom. With a clear view out the window into the tree, I noticed something was missing. No, it can't be, I said. Then raced over to the window to get a better look. The baby was gone. From the window, I could see the front of my car. There was no more lipstick message either. Rapidly, I went to get my phone. It has to be here. She couldn't have gotten rid of that, I whispered to myself. Frantically, I searched for the call from the unknown number that happened the night before. It wasn't there. It had disappeared. No, no, no. I'm not crazy. It happened. I know it happened. Walls slowly began to close in on me as the room got smaller. My heart rate took off like a rocket and cold sweat formed on my brow. In nothing but my underwear, I bolted from the house like a racehorse off at the tracks. For a solid minute, I ran down the street at a dead sprint. Once my senses began to return, I slowly moved from a run to a jog, then a walk. Neighbors pointed and snickered. A couple of housewives gave sly, lascivious looks while they hugged their husbands goodbye for the day. Sheepishly, I threw my hands in the air. TGIF, am I right? Back in my house and fully dressed, I began to try and piece together what had happened. The phone call could have been made from anywhere, but the baby doll and the lipstick someone would have to have been present to do. Then there was the case of how everything disappeared. Someone would have to be present for that. And in the case of my phone, in my house. Getting online to check my phone records directly from my provider did prove that in fact a phone call had come through on the night and at the time I received that strange message. Tension eased from my mind that I was at least not going completely crazy. But at the same time, shivers went up my spine that someone had been in my house to delete its trace. I no longer felt safe in my own home. What had once been my castle now became my prison where an unwanted warden could enter at any time. Twenty minutes later, I had a small bag of clothes ready and called an old buddy of mine, Kevin, to see if I could crash at his place for a few nights. He suggested calling the police, but with only one phone call as any kind of evidence, it was unlikely that they could do anything to help me. He agreed to let me stay with him for a few nights until this hopefully all blew over. His place was a little ways out of town, and it would take about 45 minutes to get there. Without wasting any more time, I went out to get into my car. 
threw my things into the back seat of my sedan, and then got behind the steering wheel. Once the seatbelt was buckled, I went to turn the key. My foot slammed on the gas, causing the engine to rev, and I would have gone through the roof had I not been buckled. On my dash, right in front of my speedometer, was a Polaroid picture of me in my house not even 20 minutes prior talking on the phone. In the foreground was a gloved hand of some person I couldn't identify holding a piece of rubber. Forget this, I said as I crumpled the picture up, threw it from the car window, and then put the vehicle into reverse. Nothing crazy happened for the first 10 minutes of the drive. Once I began to leave town and the traffic thinned out, there were only a few cars left on the road. One by one, the other cars turned for their separate destinations, except one. It was a dark red compact that looked very similar to my ex's. Nothing else exceptional about it, but something in the back of my mind told me to keep an eye on it, and that's what I did for the next 20 minutes. My eyes were glued on it so well that I didn't even notice my engine temperature gauge when it began to creep into the red. Steam rose from the hood and the car sputtered before I pulled over just in time as it completely conked out on me. Could anything else go wrong? I asked myself, then held my breath for a second, fearing the universe would reply with a yes. In that time, the dark red compact approached, then passed me as it continued on its way. I let out a sigh of relief. Exiting the vehicle, I went to check under the hood. What in the hell? I said. Inside looked like coolant had exploded all over the engine. I checked the hoses and noticed one of them had a portion of the rubber top of it sliced off. My mind raced back to remember the photo I had seen when I first entered the car. It was almost funny how a hole in your rubber can ruin your day. The irony and implications weren't lost to me. It would have taken 15 minutes by car to my friend's house from there, so about a 30 to 40 minute walk. I decided to go on foot, grabbed the bag and locked my doors, then began to hoof it. Got to Kevin's place, but when I knocked on the door, there was no answer. His car was in the driveway and I could hear the TV on. Down the street a ways was a dark red compact that didn't escape my attention. Gave Kevin's cell phone a call. Clearly I could hear it ring from inside the house, still no one answered. Maybe he's busy, I thought to myself, then went around back to see if he was there. His back door was open to crack, so I went inside. Kevin, you here? I called out from the entrance. No response. I went further into the house to find him. Once I got past the kitchen and the dining room, I was in the living room. Now, I'm no police officer, but there were clear signs of a struggle. Cushions from his couch were thrown all around, the side table was knocked over, and two of the lamps were on their sides. Through the living room towards the hallway I went. Halfway through, my phone began to ring. It was a blocked number again. Palms sweaty and throat dry, I answered with a croaked, Hello? Deep breathing came across the line. It wasn't like the creepy deep breathing when someone calls in a horror movie. Born like the other person had just ran a marathon and called to tell me about it. I gave them a bit to regain their breath. Don't worry about Kevin. He's safe with me. Desi, what have you done? We've been through this before, Norm. Desi is at her mom's in Michigan, trying to get over the asshole that broke her heart. This is your unborn child. Mommy was going to call me Norma, after you, Daddy. But you can call me your baby girl. I'm not... I'm not gonna do that. I'll call you Norma if you like. Just tell me where Kevin is. Are you still in the house? We are, Daddy. We're ready to play a game. Look, I'm not playing any kind of game. Let Kevin go and we can talk. Whatever is wrong, we can work it out. We were good together. I've been thinking about it, and I think I made a mistake. I shouldn't have broken up with you. I was scared. Scared of becoming a father. We can try again if you like. I said in an attempt to buy some time as I searched around the house to find where she was with Kevin. Daddy, you're being silly. I'm your baby girl. I can't have a kid with you. We're gonna play a game I made up. It's called Seek and Seek. I seek you, and you seek Kevin. If I find you, you die. If you don't find Kevin in time, he dies. Good luck, Daddy. I know you can do it. With that, she hung up the phone. Let me tell you a bit about Kevin's house. He's a successful computer programmer, unmarried and no kids. His house isn't quite a mansion, but it's far from small. To search the place while not being found was going to take some time. I had two options. Call the cops and hide, or play her game. 
since I had no clue what the time limit on Kevin's life was, I decided to not waste a second of it and hope the police showed in time, so I chose to play our game. By the time the phone call had ended, I had only managed to make it through the west side of the house. That left the other hallway from the living room, the downstairs, and the attic to search. I got to halfway through the living room when I noticed someone was coming up the stairs. Quickly I ducked behind the couch and waited for a time I thought Desi would have passed. A sigh of relief escaped my lips when I looked around and found she wasn't camping in the middle of the house. Unsure of which way she had gone, I decided to go downstairs. Chances were better that she wouldn't go back the way she had just came. I would probably have the time it took for her to check for me upstairs to check the downstairs myself. As quietly as I could, I went down the stairs. Every step on that hardwood floor drummed in my ears and mixed with my heartbeat into an almost deafening thunder. Biggest problem with the basement was that it was sectioned off into more rooms than the upstairs. Kevin had a little cinema room off to the left, and that was where I began my search. There was a projection screen on one side of the room and a projector booth on the other. In between were three rows of seats tiered just like a movie theater. Darkness as thick as night filled the room. To turn on a light would risk giving away my position. Phone screen light was the best I could do. I turned it on and walked in. Something tripped my feet and it must have flipped a switch. Bright light cut through to the projection screen. A loud boom erupted from the theater speakers as a movie began to play. No way it wasn't heard throughout the house. Quickly I darted from the room and down the hall. Pounding feet stampeded down the stairs and echoed through the corridor I was in. With no time to think, I rushed through the closest door I could find and slowly shut it as to not make a sound. Electricity pulsed through my entire body since this game of cat and mouse became serious. Daddy. Daddy. I know you're down here. I could hear Desi say. It was only a matter of time before she came to search the area. My eyes rapidly surveilled the surroundings. Against the far wall was a bed, to the left was a dresser, and to the right was a walk-in closet. First thought that jumped to my mind was to crawl under the bed, but that would be too obvious. The closet was another option, but how easy would that be to find someone in there, and then where would I go if she opened it up? Quiet filled the room. The movie had been stopped. Next, I could hear footsteps coming down the hallway. Creaking noises could be heard as another door opened. Clanging metal rang out. She was in the utility closet near me. Another thought came to me. I could lock the door to the room I was in, but that would be a dead giveaway. Aha! She exclaimed as she opened another door across from me. There wasn't much time and no good places to hide. My heart stopped. A soft thud came from the door. She must have been listening in the hallway, trying to see if she could hear me panic or scurry. I whipped out my phone and called Kevin. My only hope was that if she heard his phone ring, she might think it was mine and go looking for me. Just as the doorknob began to turn, I pressed the send button. His ringtone rang loud. The doorknob stopped its turning. Her feet hurried away. After two more rings, I ended the call. With shaking hands, I wiped the sweat from my forehead. Thought about following where the ringtone had come from, but chances were she hadn't left his phone on him. Went through four more rooms, but they were all empty. Ten minutes later, and I was in the last room of the basement, where another one of those safety pin dolls hung in a closet by a noose almost screamed, which was probably what she was going for. My hand shot to my mouth and successfully held it back. Only the east side of the first floor and the attic remained to look in. I peeked out of the door from the last room and all seemed clear. With ears pricked for the slightest sound, I walked back towards the stairs. Hairs on the back of my neck were standing straight up. Couldn't shake the feeling I was being watched. It felt like there were a pair of hot white holes in the back of my head. As I walked past the last door before the stairs, it burst open and out jumped Desi. Her face, wearing her usual look of a mask with the addition of heavy eyeshadow and bright red lipstick made her seem like a clown from my worst nightmares. Instantly she toppled me over and was on top of me. Her hands flew up as I caught a glimpse of silvery steel flash before my eyes. A hot and burning sensation spread from under my right eye to across my face. Daddy? I'm so sorry. She said and dropped the knife. She then began to cry, which did not help her mascara any. It started to streak and bleed all over her face. Why did you kill me, Daddy? I only wanted to love you. I didn't kill you. It, it was a miscarriage. You can't prevent those. It's sad, but they happen. If only you had loved Mommy more, your love would have saved me. 
That's not how it works, Norma. Sometimes there's nothing you can do. Her crying continued. Her hair hid her face from me. That's not true, Daddy. Your love can still save me. Trade your life for mine, and I'll be born. In a flash, she flipped her hair back. The tears had stopped, and she stared me right in the eye, her face as cold as stone. She grabbed the knife and was on me once again. This time I was ready and slugged her right in the chin before she could lash out. Her body went limp as soon as I struck. I pulled myself free and ran up the stairs. Back in the living room, I was surprised to see Kevin tied up, sitting on the sofa. His mouth covered with duct tape, his hands tied in front of him, and his feet strung together under him. He was screaming something, but I couldn't make out what he was saying because of the duct tape. I ran to untie his feet first so we could run if we had to. When that was done, I went to get the tape off. His eyes were as wide as saucers, sweat dripped from his face, and he continued to scream unintelligibly. It's a trap, he blurted out as soon as I took off the tape. It'll be okay. I already knocked her out downstairs, I told him. Then who's behind you? He asked. Before I could turn around, I was hurled to the ground. My face smashed against the wood as a crimson streak spread across the floor. A metallic taste flooded my mouth and stars sparkled in my eyes. With a hellish scream, Desi pounced on me. My shoulder went numb as soon as she stabbed me and a warmth trickled down my back. My hands feverishly clawed along wood in a scramble to drag me away. Fingers went dead as cold metal pierced me again. She rolled me over about to land the killing blow to my heart. In place of her usual mask-like expression, there was a demonic fire in her eyes. Straddled across my chest, knife clenched in both hands, she raised them up. I closed my eyes, not wanting her twisted face to be the last thing I saw. But the knife never landed. There was a thump and a wheeze, then another thump. Slowly, I opened my eyes to see Kevin standing above me. He held a small metal lamp between his still-bound hands. Stunned, I looked to the floor beside me. Desi was there, eyes wide open and body twitching. A small trickle of blood ran down from her head to a pool on the ground. Crazy bitch, Kevin said, staring at Desi. Let's call you an ambulance. I could sure use one, I replied. Kevin rolled me over and pressed a couple of claws on my wounds to slow the bleeding, then dialed the police. They were there in 20 minutes. Desi was taken into custody. She will be spending the next 10 years in a psych ward pending evaluations. I made it out alright, but both shoulders hurt now when it's about to rain. I haven't even thought about dating again. It'll be a long while before I'm ready to commit to anyone. What had started off as a lovely spring soon turned into the bitter winter of my life. I had just finished my first two years of general surgery when Dr. Stenson agreed to take me on in his practice to finish the last four years to specialize in plastic surgery. He was a brilliant surgeon whose latest work had revolutionized rhinoplasty. That's nose jobs for anyone who doesn't know. It had always been a dream of mine to make people who they wanted to be. I see plastic surgery not necessarily as vanity but as a way for people to express who they really are. I knew that as a young woman there would be barriers, that things would be harder and I'd have to prove myself. My expectation though was that things would be professional. From my experience in general surgery, that's how it was. Dr. Stenson was different, however, and by different, I mean he was a little off. To a degree, you expect that with someone as brilliant as he is. His dedication and talent separated him from normal people, and to compensate for his lack of social skill, he relied on his abilities to make that bridge. Not to say he didn't have a certain charm to him, his bedside manners were impeccable with clients. That makes what he did even more surprising. It started off with accidental brushing in the office. I'd be in the charting room dictating notes. He would come in under the pretense of having to review something. More than enough room to get around me, but his crotch would run across my shoulders as I sat there. It was made even more uncomfortable by the firmness under his scrub pants. He never made any off-color remarks or anything like that, so I just tried to ignore it. One day, he called me into his office to talk about an upcoming breast augmentation. We discussed what procedure would be best and why, how we were going to shape the breast and what the client wanted. I think you should show me your rack, doctor, he said. Pardon me? I said. It's nothing sexual, he responded. I simply think that yours would be what this client is looking for. 
My stomach turned at the sight of his sly smile. Immediately, I felt uncomfortable with his request. There were much better ways to determine what she would want than me exposing myself to him. He insisted, however, and the pressure to comply was intense. Not that he threatened me or my job, but the implications did not have to be said due to his persistence. After that, I tried to avoid him as much as possible. Things went back to normal for a while and I let my guard down once again. Slowly, he became disgruntled with my work and would make remarks about my incompetence at certain tasks. He would say things like how I didn't do a facelift right, or use the best techniques for a certain procedure, or how I was impossible to train. All these things he would say, yet clients would come back and thank me for how good of a job I did. It was confusing to say the least. Despite all of this, he still thought it was a good idea to ask me to dinner one night. Naturally, I told him no. I found out you don't tell Dr. Stinson no. He didn't fire me or anything like that, but the put-downs came more frequently and more intensely. It bled over to the staff. I began to feel shunned around the office. My requests for materials would be delayed. Calls and emails would not be forwarded to me. The workplace became toxic. One day, I went to the copy room. The nurse and the secretary gave me cold glares as I walked past to retrieve some things I had printed off. When they thought I was out of earshot, I heard the nurse whisper to the secretary. I was told she forced him to look at her, well, bosom. He tried to object, but she practically flashed him. He had to force her to put them away. No, replied the secretary. There have been rumors that she's loose, but I never would have imagined that. My lower lip quivered and tears threatened to fall cold like an autumn storm as I ran to the washroom. Notes were slipped into my locker on occasions. They were typed and never signed. Odd messages like, pressure turns coal into diamonds, someday you'll be my sparkle, or pictures of me with some of my parts photoshopped and the words, I could make you perfect. Of course, I could have left the practice, but to do so would have been career suicide. If he could get the office to turn on me, imagine what he could do with his colleagues. To have that I finished my residency under Dr. Stinson would open any door I wanted. I thought that if I just ignored it, it would all go away. Nothing went away. Everything intensified. Silence only encouraged him. He knew I would do nothing about it. Late night phone calls began. He wouldn't say anything. No words. No breathing. Only dead quiet. Somehow, there was no number that came through on caller ID. Only reason I knew it was him was because who else would it be? The only option to get out of this without completely throwing my career into the trash would be to gather some kind of evidence. To do so, I would have to try to snoop around his office in case there was anything there I could use. That's exactly what I did. I pretended to have to work late one night to catch up on charting. Once all the staff left, I made my way to his office. Of course it was locked. I didn't have the keys, but I knew where they were kept. After I got them out of the receptionist's desk, I went back and got in. It was a typical office. There was his desk at the far end with a couple of chairs in front of it, filing cabinets on both sides and a wet bar by the door. I flipped on the light then began to rifle through his filing cabinet, but there was nothing but patient information in those. His desk produced no results either. It seemed hopeless. There was no reason for him to keep anything incriminating around. This whole thing could end in a dead end. I was on my way out when I noticed that there was a cabinet above his wet bar. Could be where he kept extra bottles of liquor, but his supply was all on display in the shelves at the bar. I've come this far, I thought to myself. Might as well look everywhere since I'll never get this chance again. The cabinet was fastened. It seemed to be a simple latch lock though, so I ran to get a small scalpel. Slid the thin metal blade in between the cabinet and the door, and then shimmied the lock open. Inside was a large three ring binder. I opened the binder and was shocked by what I saw. In meticulous detail, there were descriptions of various nurses, clients, and other female residents that had come into his office. Some had pictures of their houses, pictures of them out in public, locks of hair, and a few of the clients had strips of skin in their section. This was beyond unethical, definitely more in the realm of criminal. I came upon my section of the book. It had pictures of me in the chart room, at the break area, even of me in the showers there at work. This was unreal. A man as respected as Dr. Stinson doing such things, but it did add up with how he treated me. 
So engrossed was I in what I had found that I never noticed the sound of feet coming down the hall. Dr. Spencer, what are you doing in my office? I was driving by and noticed the light on, thought I had left it on by mistake, Dr. Stenson said. I was on the floor huddled over the binder. He probably didn't notice at first. Had he, I doubt he would have said anything to begin with. Frozen in panic, I didn't know what to do. Here I was with damning evidence on the man. It wasn't like he would just let me waltz out of there. I, um, I, um, I mumbled. He must have looked around, and when he saw the cabinet open, he didn't have to guess what I had found. Oh, Dr. Spencer, you weren't supposed to find that. In fact, you haven't done anything you were supposed to do. I don't get it. I established dominance over you, showed you my high value, the employees listened to me, I even tried to send you notes of encouragement. The other ones would give me what I wanted, but not you, he said while he walked towards the wet bar. What is it that you want? An athlete? A man with more power? What? He talked as casually as a person would ask you what you wanted to eat. You've seen my Maserati out front. How much more alpha do I need to be? He said while he poured himself a drink. For being so smart, he was dumb when it came to women, or a psycho. To this day, I'm still not sure. I don't want any of that. I want to do my job, I said. Slowly, I got up and collected the binder. Figured I'd just try to walk casually out the door. Maybe his thoughts were too preoccupied to notice I still had evidence against him. When I got to the door, Stenson threw his glass at my head. Shards exploded as I ducked to avoid it. Cuts on my face from the fragments burned. You think I've forgotten what you have? You're going to give me the binder. Then you'll give me what I want. After that, I might let you keep your residency here, he said. He came towards me in a nonchalant manner. My heart rate shot up and my knees went wobbly. It felt like I was going to faint when his hand touched my face. All I could do was cling to the binder tenaciously while his other hand tried to rip it from me. Using a force I didn't expect, he wrenched at the binder again. I kept my hold, but he threw me to the ground. In a flash, he was on top of me, pawing at me. My eyes finally focused on something that shined in the light. It was the scalpel I had used to jimmy the lock. My hand darted out and grabbed it. Next, I wildly stabbed over my shoulder, not caring where I struck. I knew I hit my target when he yelled out in pain. Set on autopilot, I didn't stop until I felt him get off of me. When I rolled over and got a good look at him, he was covered in blood. His breath was labored. There must have been over a hundred cuts from his face to his arms. Without saying a word, I grabbed the binder and ran out of there as fast as I could. It wasn't until I got home that I called the police. They searched his office and his house for him, but he wasn't there. They found that he had emptied his bank accounts and one of his private planes was missing. He's still out there somewhere. With how much money he had, he could have moved to South America and might never be found. Naturally, he has lost his license to ever practice again here in the States. The media had a field day with the binder and many more victims have come forward. It's sickening how he used his position to get away with what he did for so long. Though, for a period of my life, things seemed cold and the sun rarely shined. Spring has returned now. I'm pleased to say that I got taken on by another surgeon. No incidents like this have happened since. I'm about to finish up my residency, and I look forward to the summer when my hard work will come to fruition. <laughs>